The study of plants is not only a very fascinating topic, but it allows you, the teacher, to continue to develop the student's process skills. Skills in observing, communicating, comparing, organizing, and ordering information as they compare the differences and similarities between plants and seeds. We're going to divide this section up into four main parts. First, a little bit about technology, how man has utilized technology to get the most from plants. Secondly, we're going to see how germination works, how a seed becomes a plant. Third, we're going to take a look at the growth of plants and the needs of plants. And finally, we're going to look at the plant parts. Let's start with the technology section. The underlying goal is to develop respect and appreciation for all living things, and plants are no exception. Have some plants in your classroom. Allow students to take care of them on a rotating basis. Label each plant container so they can learn the names. And as you study more about how plants help us, you may make a bulletin board or have students keep little notebooks of different products that come from plants. Not only do we get food and make food for animals, but we also get a variety of other products. From the bark of trees, we get cork, cinnamon, and some medicines like quinine. We build our houses with wood and make paper from the pulp. We use the sap to make rubber, syrup, and chewing gum. And we use the seeds, stems, and leaves to make cotton, linen, and rope. You should caution your students that some plants can be harmful, even some common house plants, like the Diffenbachia. And then, of course, we have poison ivy and poison oak. Both of these plants are closely related. Poison ivy is found on the east coast. Notice that the stem has three leaflets. One stands by itself at the tip, and the other two form a pair below it. You should also notice the notch on the bottom of these two leaflets. Here's another species of ivy. Notice once again the similar characteristics. On the west coast, we have poison oak. The leaves are similar to poison ivy with the three leaflet combination and the notch at the bottom of the two lower leaves. The leaves are shiny green but may turn red or orange in the autumn. Remember these plants and have your students draw pictures of each. Now let's go on and investigate seeds and start by taking a look at different types of seeds. This is a good exercise in categorizing and organizing objects. Here we're going to look at a variety of different seeds and put them in different orders like size or color or shape. As your students work with the seeds, they'll start to see many similarities amongst all the seeds. Here's the ones that I would recommend you use. The lima and kidney bean, the green bean, the pinto bean, and the squash, the black-eyed pea, the garbanzo bean, and corn. And finally we have the green pea, the soybean, and the black bean. When your students are through ordering the seeds, it's time to bring the magnifiers out and let them make some observations about them. What can they see that's similar from one seed to the next? Well, they should notice that little oval mark, and when they look closer at it, like you see on this lima bean, it's not really symmetrical. In other words, it's not the same on both sides. On one side, if you look real close, there's a tiny little pinhole. That hole is where the bean seed breathes when it's germinating. We're going to continue now and germinate these seeds and look more closely at the three main parts of the seed. The lima beans in this container have been soaking now for about three hours, and it's easy to split them apart. The first thing we notice is that the outer seed coat peels back quite readily. As we crack the seed open, we see inside a tiny little plant. This plant is complete with roots, a stem, and tiny little leaves. On either side of this embryo are two big food pieces. This is starch for the developing plant. Now let's survey some ideas that you can do to help your students further understand this process of germination. First, you can drop some seeds like lima bean or kidney seeds into some very hot water. When the seed falls in the water, the heat of the water expands the gas inside the seed and the gas starts to bubble out of that tiny little spot. 
It's another good way to reinforce that that one point exists. You can have your students germinate different types of seeds and make comparisons. Remind them that within each seed is that special code that determines what type of plant that seed will become. To develop skills in sequencing, you can divide your class up into small groups of about three students per group. Germinate seeds on a daily basis. After about a week, take a sample seed from each group and give it to your student groups and let them look at the whole sample of seven seeds. Allow them to put them in order of growth and learn about how seeds grow over the period of a week. Another thing you can do is have them compare germination rates. Which seeds germinate the fastest? You might have them measure the growth as the seeds germinate, or you might even get them to understand percentages. Do all seeds germinate? Out of 10 seeds, for example, how many of them will germinate? And will all groups get the same value? Now let's look at different ways that we can germinate seeds. One of the easiest ways to germinate seeds is to get an old plate and lay a piece of blotter paper or paper towel on it. Sprinkle the seeds on top of the paper towel, cover it with another piece of paper towel, and keep it moist. Don't overwater it, but make sure that it doesn't dry out. After a few days, when you peel back the first paper towel, you see a wide variety of germinating seeds. Some of the smaller seeds on this plate are radishes, beets, and watermelon. Even when you compare individual seeds of the same type, you'll see different states of germination, even if they were germinated at the same time. Some other interesting ways to germinate seeds, one you may already be familiar with, is the old jar with the blotter paper, where you glue the seeds onto the piece of blotter paper, roll it up, drop it in a jar, and keep the blotter paper moist by pouring water in the jar. If you want to press the seeds outward to hold the blotter paper against the jar, you can fill the jar with gravel. In this jar, you see I have radish seeds sprouting, and in this one over here, you see lima bean seeds. Another way is to give each student a paper cup that's filled with vermiculite. Have the student poke their finger into the vermiculite and drop a seed into it, just below the surface. Pour a small amount of water into it and make sure that it stays moist. You can see if it's moist by feeling the top layer of the material. If it feels damp, it's still helping to germinate the seed. After a while, you can actually pull the seed out and take a look at the roots. This particular bean seed has got roots that are digging all the way down to find the source of the water. Another technique, and my favorite technique, is to use a plastic bag and a piece of paper towel. Cut the paper towel to fit perfectly inside the bag, and then run a line of staples along the bottom of the bag. Make sure that the distance between each staple is such that seeds won't fall between them and drop into the lower portion. Drop the seeds inside the bag and let them fall down to the proper level of this line of staples, and then pour some water into the bag, just enough to fill the bottom area, not soak the seeds. Then you can put a date on the bag, hang the bags, and watch the seeds germinate. Let me show you what I've done with some radish seeds and some black-eyed peas. When the bags are hung vertically, the plant gets to grow much better than it would growing in a dish. Students can measure the height of the plant, and they can even look closely at the roots. In some places, the roots have actually found their way through the staple. You can either put different varieties of seeds in each bag, or all the same kind. When we look at these black-eyed peas, your students may wish to measure the length of the roots as they go down toward the bottom, or the length of the plant as it grows each day. You can graph the lengths and make a histogram. A final method for investigating germination should be done as a demonstration. This time, find two pieces of glass, about 20 centimeters or 7 inches on each side. Tape up the edges for safety. Place a piece of blotter paper on top of one piece of glass, and place your seed, like a radish seed, on top of the blotter paper. Put the other piece of glass over that, and then secure it with rubber bands. You can put each edge of the blotter paper into water and watch the seed germinate. In this experiment, I've been doing this for a few days now. I started with the with this edge in the water. The water seeps up, and the roots started going down toward the water. After about two days, I turned it. 
90 degrees and then place this edge in the water. Then the roots started going down in this direction. After a few more days, I turned it another 90 degrees and placed this edge in the water and found now that the roots are starting to turn again. This shows that the roots are being attracted toward water. Now there's one question here that we didn't consider and that's the question of gravity. This is always downward and we know that roots are also drawn by the force of gravity. So maybe we should redesign this experiment so that we only are testing the effects of water and not gravity. To do that, you might try laying this piece of glass flat and having an extra piece of paper come out as a wick and reach down into this little dish of water. When you're doing experiments with the plate in the vertical position, you'll have to use your creative talents to keep it from falling over. You might try books on either side to support it, or try a clothespin that might help jam it in the corners and hold it in position, like I've done. Now that we've literally gotten off the ground by learning about germination, let's continue and investigate how environmental conditions affect the growth of plants. As an introduction to plants, your primary student should realize that most plants grow in soil. Along with soil, plants need water and sunlight to survive. Now a common misconception is that more is better. For example, if plants need water to grow, the more water we give them, the higher they'll grow. We want to dispel these beliefs and at the same time investigate the scientific method as we do this next experiment. Every experiment must have a problem. In this case, our problem is, what are the best conditions for growing plants? We'll start by giving each student a plastic cup. This is the 16 ounce size, and before class, you should have punched holes in the bottom with a hot nail. We have about four or five holes here. Fill each cup almost to the top with potting soil and make sure that your students are aware that all the soil came from the same bag. In other words, they all have the same type of soil. Give each student two kidney beans. Have them wet their soil and plant the kidney beans just under the soil. After a few days, one or both of the beans will sprout up. You only want one plant in a container, so have the students remove one of the plants if they both sprout. You may even plant a few extras on your own in case one student has one that has no results at all. Once the plants begin to sprout, they may look like this plant over here. We're ready to begin our experiment. Divide your class into six equal groups. The students in group one will be the control group. They'll take their plants to a sunny spot in the room and give them 50 milliliters of water every Monday and Friday. The students in group two will be the low water group. They'll keep their plants in direct sunlight, but they'll only feed their plants with water on Mondays. The students in group three will be the extra water group. They'll keep theirs in sunlight also, but they'll feed their plants with 50 milliliters of water every day of the week, Monday through Friday. Those in group four will be the salt water group. Instead of giving their plants fresh water, they'll give their plants a special mixture of salt water. To make this up, you want to mix about 20 grams of salt with about 4 liters or a gallon of water. If you don't have the balance to weigh out the salt, you can use a heaping tablespoon. Incidentally, this is fed on Mondays and Fridays just like the control group. Group number five is the plant food group and once again you'll mix a special mixture up this time of water with plant food in it that's dissolved so whenever they water their plants they're also feeding their plants with fertilizer so they'll do this on Monday and Friday with about 50 milliliters each time. The final group is the low light group. Like the control group they'll give their plants 50 milliliters of water on Monday and Friday but they'll keep it in a dark area of the room. Have your students record the height of their plant every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and encourage them to use metric measurements. You should also have them record any particular dates where they add water or nutrients to their plant. After about four weeks, your students should be able to make some comparisons. By walking around and looking at the different groups of plants, they should be able to determine what are some of the optimal conditions for growing plants. You might ask some questions like, what is the effect of too much water on a plant, or too little water, or not enough sunlight? 
Then again, you might consider doing other experiments beyond this one. You might propose a question to them and say, how could we test the effect of different soils on the growth of plants? And let them come up with the idea that we start all the plants at the same time and give them all the same amount of water and the same amount of sunlight, but give them different soils this time. We're continuing with this scientific process, this problem-solving process, and it's a very valuable experience. Another valuable experience and a good project you can have your students do is adopting a tree. This time you want to get the parents involved, so it may involve sending a letter home to the parents. You would like the students to find a tree near their home which they will adopt. They can name their tree if they like, and they should visit it at least once a week. They want to observe and record as many things about their tree as they can throughout the school year. Observe it during the seasons, when it's raining, when it's cold. See what type of things live near the roots and what things live in the branches. They may even write poems or stories about their tree. The most important part of this activity is that students will get a good appreciation for life and respect for living things, even plants. Now we move on to an activity that we all can learn from. This time, go to your local grocery store, the produce section, and get some vegetables. We're going to take different samples, put them at different stations throughout the room, have the students go around and first try and identify the vegetable. What is it? And then also try and determine whether the part of the vegetable that we eat is either a root, a stem, a leaf, a flower, or a seed pod, which is really an advanced stage of a flower. Let me show you what I picked up from my grocery store. We have a beet, a sweet potato, two different types of radishes, and a rutabaga. Each of these is the root part of the plant, and that's the part that we eat. The sweet potato, incidentally, makes a fine plant when it's suspended with toothpicks in a jar of water. We also eat stems. For samples, I have the green onion, the celery, the rhubarb would also be good here, and I have a potato. The potato, unlike the sweet potato, is really a stem, but it grows underground. Some examples of leaves that we eat are lettuce, cabbage, and spinach. The cauliflower is a flower, as is the broccoli, and we eat those too. After the flowers go to seed, we find other foods that we eat, like corn and peppers and even green beans. To have more fun with this activity, cut up little pieces of each vegetable and allow your students to taste each sample. Have them record what each sample tastes like. The goal in this activity is to get your students to be able to identify more vegetables than their parents. Maybe even some of those strange ones like kohlrabi. That last activity should introduce your students to different parts of plants. They should realize that in some plants we eat the flowers, like cauliflower. Others we may be eating the stems, the leaves, or the roots. Let's now investigate in more depth these parts of the plants. We'll start with the flowers. The main function of the flower is the reproductive organ of the plant. Most plants reproduce sexually, which means that there's a male and a female part in the flower or on different parts of the plant. In some cases, you may have an all-male plant and an all-female plant, and for the flower to be fertilized, the pollen from the male plant must reach the flower on the female plant. Some plants, like grasses, don't have the petals on their flower like other plants do, but they still have the flower and they still make seeds. It's the flower's purpose to make the seeds. Once the seeds are made, we then have the ability to regenerate the plant. Let's take a look at some of these plants and seeds that I found in my local neighborhood. The ones that you might find in your neighborhood could be quite different. First I have over here the flowers and seeds from a eucalyptus tree. In this variety of eucalyptus, the flowers are a beautiful red color. Once the flowers are pollinated and they go to seed, they turn into something like this. If you open these up, you can find the tiny seeds inside. Other varieties of eucalyptus may have entirely different looking seeds, like the ones you see here. These are acorn shaped and much different than the first ones we saw. Another type that I think is from a eucalyptus is this bud right here. 
It opens up into a beautiful orange flower, becomes pollinated, and then turns into a seed pod that looks like this. In your area, you should have your own special types of seeds that you can bring in and show to your students. Here we have the tumbleweed. It has all these sharp seeds all over it, and when it's in its full form, the roots break and the wind blows the tumbleweed across the ground, rolling it along, and the seeds spread that way. Other ways in which seeds spread are by water. They float away, they're carried by animals, whether birds eat them or they're stuck in the fur. They're even blown by the wind. This plant here, common variety weed, has little yellow flowers that turn to seeds. And the seeds are very light and airy and they blow in the wind. Let's take a look at one of these on the micro projector. Here we're looking at the seed casing. This is the end that has the seeds. As we move over and look at the little strands at higher power, we see that there's really hundreds of tiny little barbs on these. Not only does this seed blow easily in the wind, but it can also hook onto animals and get a free ride. The study of seeds is really quite fascinating. I encourage each of you to go out and look around your neighborhood. You may not be able to identify everything you find, but you should be able to notice some really good varieties of different types of seeds, like this one here. Also on this one, I think it's a wild mustard. When you crack these seed pods open, you find the seeds inside. If you can get a pine cone, peel back the scale with a pair of pliers and let the seeds drop out. You can see the seeds hiding down in between the scales right here. If the cone has opened up, many of the seeds may already have fallen out. It's important that you have your students get hands-on experience with plants and seeds. A good way to do this is to bring samples in from your neighborhood, put them at different stations throughout the room, and have your small student groups go from station to station. Have them look closely at the seeds with their magnifiers and record their results. You may even have them predict how they think those seeds travel. Be sure and discuss the results after all the class has seen the samples. You can also have your students invent their own seed. Have them determine how their particular seed might travel. The important part here is that students are getting a better understanding and more experience with plants. They're looking closer at plants and they're learning things about plants that we many times take for granted. Many plants protect their seeds with an outer covering. An example is the orange and that's what we will investigate in this activity. Bring some samples of oranges and perhaps even some tangerines to class. Hand one out to each student group. Have them use their senses and record as much information about their orange as possible. Take the oranges away, mix them all up, and see if each group can identify their original sample from the information they've collected. What are some other things we can do with the orange? Well, first you might ask them which end is connected to the branch. Make sure they understand that. You can go on and do some math skills with a piece of string by finding the circumference by wrapping it around the orange and then measuring the length of the string. Bring out the balances and weigh the oranges and see which group has the heaviest, which group has the lightest. Another thing you can do is do some hypothesizing. Before you peel the orange, have each group make a guess as to first how many sections they think is inside and then second as to how many seeds are inside the orange. Then allow your groups to go ahead and peel the skin off. Ask them to try and peel it off so that the skin stays only in one piece. That's a real challenge. Once the skin is peeled off, you can have them compare the thicknesses of the skin. Student groups with tangerines might find a very thin skin like this, and some of the oranges, especially the California oranges, have very thick skins to keep the moisture in. How might we measure the thickness of the skin? Perhaps a student might suggest that we take pieces of paper and stack one on top of the other until it's as thick as the thickness of the skin and then count the number of pieces of paper. That's a way we might compare. Put the information on the blackboard and let the whole class see the data. Find out which group had the thickest rind and which had the thinnest. Find out which orange had the most number of sections and which one had the least and then see what the variance is in the seeds in each orange. You might even use a histogram to compare data.
Once all the experimenting is done, you can always turn your experiment into a nutritional section and everyone can munch out on the samples. The process approach to science is very important and we can continue with this approach in observing flowers. Your student groups can go from station to station, look at different types of flowers, record the color, the number of petals, the different types of structures within the flower. Let's review these just so that you are aware of what these parts are. This flower is a gladiola. If we look closely at the unopened buds, we may first notice the green outer covering. These are called the sepals. When the flower opens up, we notice the petals. The petals protect the interior part of the flower and also attract insects. In the interior of this flower, we see two different structures, the male and female parts. The male parts are called the stamens and they have the pollen. The female part is called the pistil. Pollen from the stamens goes down the tube of the pistil into the center of the flower where it fertilizes the eggs. The eggs then become seeds. If you have a more advanced class, you may wish to have your students dissect a flower, tape the particular structures on a piece of paper, and identify each item. The next part we're going to investigate is the part that brings the nutrients to and from the plant. This is the stem. Now let's review some of the activities that illustrate the importance of the stem. Remember that the potato is a stem, and when it's placed in water, it will begin to grow. Notice also that the leaves point toward the sunlight. The pothos is also a plant that you can take cuttings and place in water, and it will root. Then there's the classic experiments with the celery and the carnations. Remember when you do this to use a control. Put a carnation and a piece of celery in a glass of plain water. Take your other samples and put them in a glass of colored water. I'm using blue food coloring. Would you believe that this piece of celery used to look like this one not more than 24 hours ago? This carnation has been in the blue water for only about 8 hours and you can see the little blue streaks starting to form on the petals. When you do the experiment with the celery, be sure and slice it at a diagonal with a knife before you put it in the blue water. This makes a greater surface area and a fresh surface for absorbing the liquid. You may also want to slice a very thin section after it's been in for a while and look at it under the micro projector. Your students will see all the little tubes that the liquid travels through. Another thing is that if you do it as a demonstration, you know your students will be going home and trying this one on their own. Now we want to look at stems on a grander scale. This time we're going to be looking at tree rings and tree bark. When the tree is growing, the part that's growing is the outer part. The inside of the tree is actually dead. This part is called the heartwood, and the wood on the outside is the living part called the sapwood. It's possible to cut through sections of the outer part of the tree and kill it without actually cutting all the way through. If you can find some pieces of tree stump or stepping stones from a nursery, you can bring them in and have the students determine the age of that particular tree. The light bands were produced in the spring when growth was most active. The cells in the dark bands are smaller and have thicker walls. They were produced in late summer and fall when growth was less active. This particular tree is about 22 years old and this piece of redwood which is larger, is only 21. A final activity when we investigate bark is to do bark rubbings. Bark rubbings are fun and you get a lot of valuable process going here. What you do is tape a piece of paper onto a tree so it wraps partially around the tree and then get the flat side of a crayon and rub it along the paper. This is what a peach tree looks like. You see that the bark runs in vertical patterns. When I looked at a pine tree, I see just the opposite. Here the bark runs in horizontal rows. Now let's investigate that part of the plant whose function is to get water and nutrients from the soil. And that part is the roots. Here's some things we can do. First plant a seed in a clear plastic cup and allow it to grow right along the edge of the cup. Cover it with aluminum foil and then when you want to see how the roots are doing, just open up the aluminum foil and take a look. You may even wish to experiment with different amounts of water and see how that affects the growth of the roots. Be sure and keep this covered when you're not looking at it because roots don't like light. Some other things we can do are compare roots. 
Bring some samples in from outside and look at the different root structures. Or grow your own plants in the classroom in small paper cups with vermiculite. After the plant's grown for a while, you can carefully pull the plant out and shake the vermiculite off and compare the root structures of different plants. You may even wish to discuss what it happens when a plant gets root bound. If you let a plant grow for a while, you can show your class the roots, how they all get tangled up at the bottom. Your students can have fun also by growing plants from roots. They can grow sweet potatoes or carrots. Carrots make fine plants if they're grown in vermiculite. You may not have any success if you just put it in water. Another thing we can do is make plants from baby plants. This is called vegetative reproduction, and it's actually different than the sexual reproduction. A spider plant is a good example. You can cut off these tiny little spider plants, put them in water, have them root, and then plant them in soil. An African violet leaf will also work, but it takes about two weeks for the roots to sprout off the leaf. The final part we're going to do is germinate some radish seeds for about three days and then put the young seedlings on the stage of the microprojector and look at all the tiny little root hairs, very, very tiny, which gather water from the soil. To review, there are four major parts of a plant. The flower is the reproductive part. The roots gather water and nutrients from the soil. The stem transports the water and food throughout the plant. There are two different types of stems. The herbaceous stems, which are the soft, flexible ones, usually found on the low-lying plants, and the hard, woody stems that we find on the trees. Then, of course, there's the leaf. The leaf has the chlorophyll, and it's the food factory. It uses chlorophyll, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to make sugar. The plant needs this sugar as energy to stay alive. And we certainly shouldn't leave this unit on plants without studying leaves. There are many different things we can do. First, when you have your students look at different leaves, keep them attached to the branches and see if the leaves alternate, as you see here, or if they are arranged opposite each other, as in this example. Furthermore, students should be able to classify leaves according to different parameters, like the shape of the leaf, or is the outside edge serrated or smooth, or what does the top of the leaf look like. Another very important classification is the venation. What do the veins look like? Are they branched or are they parallel, like you see in this leaf? And don't forget to bring in a sample of a succulent, one of the waxy leaves. Ask your students why this leaf might be waxy, and you may even have them crack it open and take a look inside. They'll see that inside this leaf, there's lots of liquid. This is a means by which a plant like this can survive in a very dry climate. Let's further reinforce this idea with the following activity. Get two sponges and wet them both. Wrap one in wax paper and wrap the other in plain paper. Place them both in the sun. After a while, have a student open each one up and feel the sponge. He or she should notice that the one in the wax paper is still wet. Now let's go on to a series of activities that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Preserving plants and making leaf prints. And there are many different ways to do it. First, in preserving plants, it's always good to sandwich your specimen between newspaper first. And don't put it inside the book, but rather underneath the book, so that you're not breaking the binding on the book and getting the librarian mad at you. After a day, you can change the newspaper because some of the water will be absorbed into the first few sheets. And you can also rearrange the plant to make it in the shape you want it for your final preservation. When we get into leaf printing, very simply, one of the most common techniques is to place the leaf underneath a piece of paper and rub a flat side of a crayon along the front. Be sure that your students write the name of the plant if they can identify it after they've done their crayon rubbing. Then there are the splatter prints. You can do these with a can of spray paint. Make sure that you have lots of newspaper out for this and maybe even allow the students to spray the can under your supervision and make a nice little splatter picture like this. An alternative is to use a toothbrush and water-based tempura. The students will run their finger along the toothbrush and splatter paint all over the room. You'll have a great time with that one. The more high-tech way is to use solar graphic paper and learn about sunlight and shadows and chemical changes at the same time. Finally, a really interesting technique that I recently discovered is using carbon paper. 
This time, you have one blank sheet on the top, then you'll have your leaf, then you'll have a piece of carbon paper, and then finally, the page that you're going to print it onto. You set them all in that order, and then roll it with a rolling pin. As you roll the rolling pin across the paper, it imprints the carbon image on the bottom sheet. Remember, your leaf is here, then your carbon paper, and then your bottom sheet. When I hold it up, you see the beautiful image you get using the carbon paper. And make sure you don't try this like I did with a used sheet. The difficulty with this activity is, of course, trying to find enough rolling pins to go around. If you can't, be sure and do this as a demonstration, because this is an activity your students are bound to try on their own at home. Now, there are two other types of plants, simple plants, that we haven't discussed yet, that you should at least introduce to your students. These are the mosses and the ferns. The mosses are tiny little plants that live in moist, shady areas. They produce their own food using chlorophyll, and they appear to have stems and leaves. But in fact, they're not true stems and leaves because inside the stem, there aren't any tubes to carry water and food throughout the plant. Unlike the moss, we have the fern. The fern has the tubes and can carry the liquids throughout the plant, and it has roots, stems, and leaves. The leaves are called fronds. But unlike the normal flowering plants, the ferns don't have seeds. Instead, they have spores, and the spores are found on the bottom side of the fronds, as you see here. If you don't already have a fern in your home or in your classroom, you should get one, because they make great classroom plants. And you should look on the bottom of some of the fronds of your fern to see if you can find any spores. This particular Boston fern has a few on some of the fronds. Another thing to look for are these air roots. You don't want to cut these off because this is how the plant breathes, by getting moisture from the air. A good way to take care of this is to have a student in your classroom mist it once a day with distilled water because ferns like the moist climate.